Well, hello again, I'm Mike Mazzalongo here uh, for BibleTalk.tv. We're going to be studying uh, one of the Old Testament books uh, in this series, uh, Leviticus for Beginners, and the subtitle is Training for uh, Holiness. And uh, before I begin uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, first uh, lesson, which is the critical introduction, I want to remind you uh, about the uh, student workbook, uh, a, great, uh, a great resource for those of you who plan on you know, taking the entire course. There are 13 lessons in this, uh, in this course, in this series, and the workbook has uh, all the outlines of the lessons as I teach them, and uh, keywords, uh, passage references, so on and so forth, so that you can kind of, if you're a note taker, uh, you can keep you know, you can keep up and, uh, you know, fill in the blanks, uh, so to speak, uh, and keep your own set of notes on this course. And so uh, you can order the workbook at BibleTalk.tv slash workbooks. You can get information about that, or you can simply uh, download uh, the um, PDF file for the uh, individual classes. Those are free. If you want the workbook and you want to order that, uh, we'll ship that to you. Uh, it's a few dollars and uh, just fill out the form and they will, uh, they'll mail that to you. All right, um, the book of Leviticus uh, is probably the least read book uh, in the church today. And uh, there are several reasons uh, for this, uh, I believe. Uh, first of all, um, it's difficult to understand. As you read through Leviticus and you read about the rules, you know, about offering sacrifices and so on and so forth. First of all, it's hard to understand because they're foreign ideas to us. We don't do that today. And also it's hard for us to relate to what they're doing and kind of bring the lesson in, you know, to our lives uh, today. So it's one reason that people kind of, you know, if they're reading through the Bible in a year, when they get to Leviticus, they kind of read it quickly, more or less to just finish reading it, rather than actually grasping what's trying, you know, what, what is being taught in that book. Another reason is that many of the rituals and the rules and the regulations found in it are not, are not meant for Christians, they were meant for the Jews. And so the, the thinking is, well, why should I study these things? You know, they're not meant for me uh, today, uh, not meant for Christians in the modern age. Uh, what's the purpose of uh, uh, learning about them? Well, in this class, you'll find out, you'll find some pretty good reasons why we study this uh, book. And thirdly, the style of writing is repetitious and in some cases boring. So reading the book is difficult and it simply becomes a necessary chore uh, in the process of trying to read from Genesis all the way to Revelation. A lot of people set that as a task, you know, or as a goal in one year, I'm gonna read uh, Genesis to, uh, uh, to Revelation. And when they get to Leviticus, usually they, they slow down, they quit, or they read quickly to get on to the next book. Um, in preparing for this uh, particular class, uh, I relied uh, on various uh, resources, but there was one commentary that was extremely helpful to me, and I want to share it with you. It's the uh, Truth For Today uh, commentary uh, on the book of Leviticus by uh, Coy D. Uh, Roper. Um, this is a set of, com you can buy them individually, you know, you can get them individually, but it's a whole set of commentaries on every book of uh, the Bible. I can highly recommend it, some terrific material, and also resources by other authors contained in the commentary, something you don't uh, always see. So I can highly recommend it, uh, and it is written by uh, scholars uh, who are associated with the churches of uh, Christ. And as I say, I highly recommend this series uh, for reading, for study, and for resource uh, purposes. All right, so let's begin uh, the book of Leviticus, uh, begin with a critical introduction of this uh, book. Uh, before we uh, study the actual text of the book, it's always helpful to do, uh, as I mentioned, a critical introduction of the, um, of the book. Uh, critical introduction, what does that mean? Well, it means we study things like uh, who is the author, when was it written, uh, the reason for its writing, uh, 
the relationship of this book, the book of Leviticus, to other books in the Bible, uh, possible theme for the book, uh, how the book is outlined, and other critical information about the book so we can have some context and purpose uh, to better understand what the book is about and why it was written in the first place. So that's what we do when we do a critical uh, introduction. So let's begin by talking about the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. Pentateuch is a Greek word meaning five books. Uh, penta, five, five books. Um, eventually, it referred to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. So when we're talking about the Hebrew Bible as Christians, we're talking about the Old Testament. When the Jews are talking about the very same books, they refer to them as the Hebrew Bible. So in the Hebrew language, the first five books were referred to as the Torah. So when you hear somebody talking about the Torah, he's talking about the Pentateuch or the first five books of the, uh, the Bible. Uh, the original meaning of the word Torah uh, was uh, teaching or guidance, direction or law. Um, eventually the word was used exclusively to refer to the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. This is why the Jews often refer to these books as the books of the law or the Torah. So whenever you're reading and you, know, you see someone talking about the books of the law, doesn't the law say, well, they're referring to this set of books. There were five books and each had a particular focus in telling the story of the beginning of the relationship between God and his chosen people and how that relationship developed uh, over the years and of course its climax uh, in the coming of uh, Jesus Christ. So let's go over the, uh, the individual books themselves. I think uh, most of us are familiar with these. First book is Genesis. In Genesis, we see that God brings the creation into being. Uh, we also read about the need for salvation as it arises uh, as a result of Adam's uh, sin. Then we see God's plan for salvation initiated uh, through the selection of Abraham. God has a plan to save mankind. And the first thing he does in that plan is he chooses one man, Abraham, and through that one man will come a nation through whom eventually the Messiah will come. And so in the book of Genesis, we get the seed story of this uh, great uh, plan. In the book of Exodus, uh, we see Abraham's family becomes the nation of Israel through its miraculous liberation from uh, Egyptian slavery. Uh, God makes a covenant with the Israelites uh, to be their God and he uh, will be their, uh, they rather will be his people. We see God anointing a leader, providing a law and religious elements to maintain this exclusive relationship with his uh, chosen people. The third book and the book that we're going to study is the book of Leviticus. In this book, God provides a religious system and a religious practice to cultivate the attitude and the virtue of holiness among his people. The idea is that God is holy and he requires that his people be holy as well in order to dwell in his presence. Fourth book, again in the Pentateuch, the book of Numbers. Here, God's people are identified and they're actually numbered. Uh, Israel, we see, fails to live up to God's requirements and God eventually brings his people to the promised land uh, by his gracious uh, mercy. Uh, and we see uh, the people, uh, the Israelites, the people of God uh, begin to inhabit the uh, promised land. Uh, and then the fifth book is the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Israel here is exhorted by Moses to keep all of God's laws in the future in order to be a holy nation and thus continue to be God's people. It's like uh, uh, Moses' summary of all that has come before. Uh, 
Um, a summary of all five books is found in the book of Exodus as God addresses his people through Moses, the leader that God has put over them. And I'd like to read that. That's in Exodus uh, chapter 19. Here it says, Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And so the book of Leviticus contains the system of sacrifice used in the practice of their religion, which taught them the meaning and way to exercise this virtue of holiness required by God's people. You know, God says, I'm holy and I want you to be holy. All right, fair enough. Uh, the next question is, how do we become holy? What's the process for us to become a holy nation? Well, the book of Leviticus explains the process that uh, the Israelites had to undergo in order to become that holy nation. God didn't choose them because they were holy. He chose them in order to make them a holy people of God. Um, another thing in our introduction uh, that I want to cover is the name, the name Leviticus. Uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible, the name of each of the first five books is derived from the first word in the Hebrew text of each book. So the name of the book is, uh, is derived from the first few words in each of the uh, books. So the book of Leviticus, uh, for example, was originally named after the first words of that text. One of the words, Weikra, um, and um, uh, Weikra means, uh, and he called out, and he called out. And so Leviticus 1.1 says, then the Lord called to Moses. So the idea of the calling, of calling someone uh, became the Hebrew name of that particular book. Now, the present name, Leviticus, comes from the Septuagint, Septuagint meaning 70, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, which was produced in 250 uh, BC, before Christ. Little background story on why this was necessary. At the time, the Greek culture was quite powerful, that uh, many Jews became Hellenized, meaning they took on Greek culture, Greek ways, Greek language. Greek was the, the international language of diplomacy, of art, and so on and so forth, much like English is today. Uh, English is the second language uh, internationally. Uh, it's the language of finance and business. It's the language of aeronautics and so on and so forth. So if you go to China, for example, everybody there wants to learn how to speak English. Well, it was the same thing uh, in the second century uh, before Christ. Greek was the uh, world power and uh, uh, the Greek culture, uh, its art and its poetry and theater and all these things uh, uh, dominated the scene. And so what was happening is uh, uh, by, the, by the second century, um, uh, there were Jews who were no longer able to speak Hebrew. Uh, they were speaking Greek. They were using Greek as a language of communication. The problem with that is that the scriptures were written in Hebrew. So if they couldn't speak Hebrew, they couldn't read. And if they couldn't read, they couldn't read the Holy Scriptures. And so in the third century BC, Jewish scholars were given the task of translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And uh, this work was eventually finished, as I mentioned, in the uh, second century before Christ. Now, some scholars claim that there were actually 72 scholars that were involved, uh, six for each of the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel. Uh, 
But in the end, the work was uh, described in uh, Roman numerals, the LXX, which is the number 70, uh, repre representing the number of scholars uh, that worked on the translation. The Greek name given to the third book of the series uh, was Leviticus, which means pertaining to the Levites, pertaining to the Levites. Now, the Levites were one of the 12 tribes of uh, Israel, and they were the tribe from which both Moses and Aaron, his brother, came from. Um, in Exodus chapter 40, verse 12, God tells Moses to anoint Aaron, his, his brother, as the high priest and also to anoint Aaron's sons as priests uh, in order to assist Aaron in his work. And so from then on, the role of high priest was only open to direct descendants of Aaron's family. So Aaron was a Levite, meaning he belonged to the tribe of Levi, and he was uh, ordained as the high priest. And from then on, all other high priests came from the family of Aaron, who was part of the tribe of uh, Levi. In Exodus 32, 36, there's, a, there's a, an account there where the tribe of Levi stood with Moses in order to put down a rebellion. And God rewarded them with the task of caring for and moving the tabernacle complex and furnishings while they were in the desert. So while the, the Jews were wandering in the desert, the uh, tribe of Levi was given the responsibility of caring for the furnishings and all the things that you know, made up the uh, tabernacle uh, complex to, uh, uh, to strip it down and pack it, to move it to its new location and then to put it together uh, when they arrived at their uh, new uh, location. So uh, all of the priests came from Aaron's family who were part of the tribe of Levi. And then eventually all of the caretakers of the tabernacle and then later on the temple, all of them came from other families who were also from the tribe of Levi. Because of their special work, the Levites did not receive a tract of land as the other tribes received when they entered the promised land. Instead, God gave them 48 cities scattered throughout Israel to be their place of uh, residence. They also received a portion of the gifts and sacrifices that were brought by the people for the priests to offer to God as a sacrifice. And so the book that bears their name, Leviticus, is a book full of laws whose purpose was to reveal God to his people and to teach the people what was required to be holy what God wanted from his people then, and what God wants from his people now is one of the things that we learn now, uh, and that is, you know, what do we need to do in order to become the holy people of God? Okay, um, now the, uh, let's take a look at the author who wrote the book. The book of Leviticus does not name its author, except to say that the laws contained in it were originally given by God to Moses. You see it over and over again. God spoke to Moses you know, and, and said to Moses, tell the people such and such. This, uh, you know, this happens over and over. And from this we deduce that, well, Moses is the one who wrote the book of uh, Leviticus. For example, in Leviticus uh, chapter one, verses one and two, it says, then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them. Well, this passage here is repeated over and over again throughout the book of Leviticus. God wants to speak to the people and he does so through the leader, Moses. And so we, you know, we assume, we deduct from that, that Moses also uh, wrote down the things that God uh, told him to say to the people. And uh, as a result, we have a record of that in what is called the book of uh, Leviticus. And so Moses therefore has traditionally credited uh, 
uh, been credited with writing not only the book of Leviticus, but all five books of the Pentateuch, or if you wish, the Torah. Now there are many passages uh, that say Moses wrote down the laws and events found in the uh, Pentateuch. Uh, Exodus 17, 14, Numbers 33, 1, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 19. You can look those up on your own. There are also passages in the New Testament that claim the very same fact that Moses wrote the book of the law. Matthew 19, 8, for example, and Mark 12, 26, John chapter 1, verse 45, and Romans chapter 10, verse 5. So you have the New Testament, you have Jesus and others in the New Testament that confirm that Moses was the one who wrote Leviticus or other parts of the uh, Pentateuch. Now, of course, not everyone agrees with that. There are uh, those who discount the idea of uh, uh, miracles uh, and they try to explain the, um, uh, you know, how the Old Testament was written uh, using other theories. Uh, one uh, theory, uh, such theory, uh, is called the documentary hypothesis, the documentary hypothesis, and it was developed by uh, Julius Wellhausen, a scholar, by a biblical scholar, 1844 to 1918. So his hypothesis, what he called the documentary hypothesis, basically uh, was a liberal view, uh, which held that rather than a single author, Moses, the Pentateuch was put together over a period of centuries by uh, unknown editors, which he called redactors. Uh, and they uh, you know, put together a number of written sources which themselves were derived from various oral traditions. Wellhausen claimed that the Pentateuch's final form was derived from four major documents, document J for Yahwist or Jehovah, document E for Elohist, document D for Deuteronomist, and document P for uh, Priestly. Uh, briefly stated, the documentary hypothesis gives Moses credit uh, for uh, recording the law in Exodus 20, you know, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. He says, well, okay, Moses wrote those. He gives him credit for that. But he claims that the majority of the material written in all of the Pentateuch comes from sources other than Moses. For example, uh, he says, uh, some of the prophets wrote some of this material. Um, the written material was, uh, comes from a time of the Jews' exile in Babylon. This is in the, you know, for hundreds of years uh, later. While they were in Babylon, they wrote down many of this information in order to preserve it. That's, that's the theory anyways. Or various codes of holiness that were contained in ancient manuscripts from different civilizations, different cultures. Many cultures had um, uh, documents that contained uh, that civilization's or that culture's moral code. And so Wellhausen said, well, there were a lot of moral codes you know, from a lot of different countries. And so the various scholars picked up some of these and put them together, if you wish, uh, and uh, you know, created the, uh, the Pentateuch. Well, the documentary hypothesis uh, is an argument against the inspiration of scripture, the inspiration of Moses, but it's not a very strong argument for several reasons. Uh, very quickly, uh, there's little evidence supporting the claim that the Pentateuch was written over centuries by many authors. You can say that, but you don't have proof, you don't have documents, you know, exact documents, dated documents, dated authors you know, that can be placed in a specific order that is found in the Pentateuch. It's just a theory of how it was done, but a theory without any evidence. Uh, also, you have to reject God's role in the production and the preservation of this material. That's the whole point of the theory is to cut God out of the equation, that the Pentateuch or the entire Old Testament was 
uh, written without the help of God. Uh, there were no miracles. There, was, there is no inspiration. It's strictly a, a scholarly endeavor uh, that was compiled over the centuries and eventually uh, uh, organized into one body of work and uh, given uh, titles. That's basically the idea of the theory. Um, also, the documentary hypothesis is based on, a, on an evolutionary view of the development of Israel's religion, which has been proven uh, to be false. And then finally, there is evidence proving the early date of the writing of the Pentateuch, uh, which would be 1450 uh, to 1400 BC. Uh, and that is a thousand years earlier than the date that the uh, documentary hypothesis gives us. It says that uh, you know, the Pentateuch and the, the resources in the Bible uh, were written uh, around the fourth century uh, before uh, Christ. And so the historical record claiming Moses as the author, along with Jesus' confirmation of this fact, enables Christians to confidently believe and claim and teach that Moses is the sole author of the Pentateuch. I mean, not only do we have the information that Moses gives us, which is you know, organized in these five books, and historical confirmation that these individuals existed and these events took place. In addition to this, we have Jesus Christ himself confirming that Moses was the author of these books and Jesus you know, quotes these things. So if the Lord Jesus confirms that Moses is actually the author of Leviticus, for example, then that's, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, you don't have to give me more proof. I don't need more proof than that. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe uh, you know, uh, what he did. And I also believe those that he credited uh, with various uh, writings. And one of these people that he credited was Moses. All right, another issue is the date of writing. You know, when was it written? Of course, those who reject miraculous intervention and espouse the documentary hypothesis, they put the final formulation of the, Pen, uh, the Pentateuch, including the book of Leviticus, uh, at about 500 to 400 BC, uh, which is the start of the intertestamentary period. You know, that, that time between Malachi, you know, the last prophet Malachi, and John the Baptist, uh, 400 years there, where there was no inspired writing. So in between the Testaments. So the documentary hypothesis says that these books were, were written and put together only at that time, excuse me. Conservative Christians who accept the full inspiration of scripture and God's dynamic interaction with mankind, we date the book at the time of the Bible uh, at the time that the Bible describes its production, and that is during the life of Moses, its author. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, we know that Moses lived, like we know that Moses lived 14, 1500 years before Christ. We know that, that's a, that's a historical fact, okay? And then in the Bible it says, God said to Moses, do this, write that, tell the people this, and give them these instructions. Well, if we know Moses, you know, lived, you know, 14, 1500 years before Christ, uh, then it's only one step to conclude that the things that Moses wrote down and that we have today were written when? Well, they were written when Moses was alive. When was that? Well, 1400, 1450 uh, BC. A uh, bit of a historical time frame. Leviticus contains the laws and ordinances that God gave the Israelites through Moses during the year that the people spent camped before Mount Sinai, okay? In other words, when, okay, 1400, 1450 BC, uh, that's when it was written, but what was happening you know, to the nation? Well, we know that the nation was released miraculously from Egyptian slavery and eventually made their way in a few months they left Egypt 
they made their way to Mount Sinai, but they camped at Mount Sinai for about a year. And during that time, Moses um, wrote this material. God gave these instructions to Moses. Very important because what he was giving him was uh, the sacrificial system. Uh, how to make sacrifice, how to offer sacrifice, what the duties of the priests were uh, in the tabernacle complex. And so all of this information was put together and given to the people during the year uh, that they camped at Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. It was written after the building and the dedication of the tabernacle described in Exodus. So in Exodus, we get the information of uh, you know, how the temple was to be built and how the people built it and completed it and so on and so forth. And then uh, what happens next? Well, the people are down in, you know, before Mount Sinai and, and Moses uh, you know, uh, writes the book of Le Leviticus, which is basically a priest's handbook on how to offer sacrifice and why to offer sacrifice and so on and so forth. So you have the tabernacle built and dedicated, then uh, Leviticus is written, and then after that, the Israelites enter the promised land. Well, they don't do it the next day. We know what happens, right? Uh, they, they, they are punished uh, for their uh, failure to obey God, and they spend 40 years in the wilderness, but eventually they make it uh, to, the, uh, to, the promised, uh, to the promised land. Aside from um, uh, instructions about the priesthood, and the sacrificial system, the book of Leviticus contains several historical notes. One, the consecration of the priesthood, when they were consecrated and how they were consecrated. The punishment of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, there's a historical you know, point there. Aaron had four sons who served as priests and uh, at the very beginning of their service, uh, Nadab and Abihu uh, disobey God's commands about how to do things and are instantly killed. And so we read about that in the book of, Le the book of Leviticus. And then of course, uh, there's the punishment of one who blasphemed God. And we, we get to see the people um, obeying God's commands as to how to punish those who disobeyed uh, his laws. Uh, as far as the theme is concerned, you know, why was it written? Uh, I think we are getting an idea here. The theme of the book of Leviticus in a word is holiness. Uh, its purpose was to promote holiness so that Israel might become God's holy nation. We read in Leviticus 11, uh, 45, be holy, for I am holy. Uh, I mean, just uh, what, one, two, three, four, five, six words. But in those six words, you have the, the entire content of the book of, of Leviticus. Uh, the theme of holiness is supported and applied in practical ways throughout the book. For example, God's holiness required submission to his will. Someone says, well, yes, I want to be holy. I, you know, I want to be God's people. And we, you know, I want to fulfill that. I'm honored that God would consider me, uh, our people as his people. So where do I begin? How do I start being holy? Well, the very first lesson is holiness requires submission to God's will. Failure to obey not only regressed one's growth in the virtue of holiness, but it also had terrible consequences. As I mentioned before, the death of uh, Nadab and Abihu. Uh, why? Because they, they didn't follow the procedure in, in, uh, you know, in offering sacrifice. Um, another point about holiness. Holiness among the Jews required them to carefully observe the rituals of the law. You know, we see in the New Testament, you know, the Pharisees were you know, uh, very fastidious in keeping all points of the law and we, we call them hypocrites. Well, they were hypocrites because they were, they were only uh, keeping the law you know, on the outside. On the inside, they were full of lust and they were full of envy and they were full of slander and they were full of you know, all kinds of sins inside. Their uh, compliance to God's law was a, was a form of hypocrisy. Uh, 
But make no mistake that compliance to God's law was required. God wanted uh, his people to obey uh, his laws, especially the rituals contained in his uh, law. Uh, God defines the element of holiness in every setting and every society. And so for the Jews, a holy life was seen in the practice of the sacrificial system as well as keeping the law, the everyday practice of keeping God's laws. This was the way to holiness. The third thing, uh, God provided the priests, the high priest and the priests and the Levites to provide instruction and assistance and an example of a holy life for the people to learn from and to emulate. They had someone to give them an example of what a holy life was supposed to be like. And then Fourthly, it was a combination of obeying the law, observing the sacrificial system, and loving one's neighbor as oneself that produced a holy life which was pleasing to God. Yes, you obeyed God. Yes, you followed the instructions for worship. And yes, you loved your neighbor. You loved God and you loved your neighbor as yourself. You know, that third very important element. And those three together, practiced together sincerely, is what created uh, a holy spirit, a holy nature in the people of God. You know, we often fail to recognize the application of this book for our own lives today, because most of it deals with you know, archaic rituals in the sacrificing of animal and various foods, you know, we don't do that anymore. And so because we don't do those things anymore, uh, many times we fail to see the significance and the lessons uh, in those uh, practices uh, that we could learn from uh, today. But the principles contained in Leviticus are timeless and they're quite pertinent for our lives today as Christians. Uh, Roper, remember I mentioned the uh, commentary, Coy Roper, he lists five modern applications for today's Christians, uh, values uh, that Leviticus has for Christ Christians today. And I wanna share those with you very quickly. First of all, he says, the emphasis on holiness is directly applicable for us today because this is what God is calling us to as well. In 1 Peter 1, 15, 16, it says, um, uh, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And so we see uh, in 1 Peter, that's New Testament, Peter is one of the apostles, he's saying that God wants from us Christians, uh, you know, believers in Christ, what, what does he want from us? Well, he wants the same thing. We're his people today, and as his people, he wants us to be holy. Why? Because he is holy, he hasn't changed, and he wants the very same things from us uh, today. Uh, secondly, the sacrificial system, you know, the shedding of blood to redeem the sins of the people, this was a preview of what Christ would do for us today. Knowing more about those sacrifices will help us appreciate and understand more perfectly Christ's sacrifice for us. They were a teaching tool. Uh, for thousands of years, uh, they offered sacrifice and uh, when we understand the purpose and the manner in which these things were done, we begin to see how they apply to us uh, today. Knowing more about those sacrifices helps us appreciate and understand more perfectly Christ's sacrifice for us. Thirdly, the, there is a similarity and a relationship between the various sacrifices that the Jews offered then and the sacrifices that we as Christians offer today. For example, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices when we serve God with good deeds. Romans chapter 12, verses one, or two, one and two. 
we're still offering sacrifices, except it's not animals. We're offering ourselves as sacrifices. We're offering our service, our good deeds, uh, our giving, our worship. You know, we're, we're offering ourselves uh, to God today as a sacrifice. Uh, we offer a sacrifice of praise with our lips today. They would, they would burn incense and the incense represented their prayers and their thoughts and so on and so forth that, that went up to God. Well, today we don't burn incense for that. Today, our prayers are what rise up to God and are pleasing to Him. Uh, a, a, a smell, as they say, a soothing aroma uh, before God. Um, our financial support of the church and its various works in preaching the gospel is a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, which is well-pleasing to God. That's how Paul describes these things in Philippians chapter four, verse 18. So we have, we have different objects. You know, we don't use animals and incense and bread and food and flour and wine, you know, the different objects and different methods of offering and a different ritual. We're the priests now. We don't have a priest doing that for us but it's the same God and the same result and the same motivation. We love God. And so we are motivated by that love uh, to live a holy life. And living a holy life uh, entails much of the same type of uh, things that uh, uh, we do in order to please God. It's just different objects and different, you know, different way of doing it. Fourth, uh, Leviticus should help us rethink our attitude about ritual itself. We want to make church, uh, you know, church service uh, more entertaining, less formal. We want to dress up the rituals with music and drama and emotion. But Leviticus teaches us that God is the one who gives the rituals, not man. We don't, we don't have a right to make up rituals in order to please God or offer to God. We don't have a right to do that. He's the one that makes the rituals and we don't have a right to change the rituals. He gives them the way he wants them, uh, the way that they're supposed to be done in order to be acceptable before God. Uh, in Christianity, we only have two rituals and five practices given to us by God. The two rituals are baptism and communion. Okay. I'm not saying they're empty rituals or they're just rituals, but they are rituals. One is a burial in water. The other one is the partaking of uh, unleavened bread and fruit of the wine. They are rituals. And we have five practices, uh, uh, praise, prayer, preaching, teaching, and giving. Those are the five practices of our uh, religion. Leviticus teaches us that we should follow God's instructions concerning our rituals and practices. And as those who want to be holy people of God, we should also give ourselves over to these rituals and practices of the New Testament with heartfelt devotion and wholehearted participation. I say to the brethren, get into it. You know, you're at worship, get into it. You know, you've gotten dressed and gotten there on time and you got your kids to Bible class and now it's worship time. And I see so many just sitting back and they're, not, they're just mouthing the songs, barely listening to what's going on. Why have you come? Why are you there? What's the point? You know, you go to a movie, you pay 12, 15 bucks to get in to see a movie and you do everything to enhance your experience, right? You buy the popcorn, the bucket, the barrel of popcorn and a drink and some chocolate, whatever, you know, and you watch the previews, you can't wait till the movie gets going, you're into it. Well, I say we need to get into it, uh, into the rituals that God have, has given us and to the practices. If you're gonna sing, sing out, sing loudly, sing all the words. If you're going to pray, pray and amen the prayer. If you're going to hear the preaching, pay attention to the preaching, see how it affects your life. If you're in a class, ask questions, get involved in what's being taught so that you can leave the class more knowledgeable than when you came into the class. And if you give, be generous. God loves a cheerful giver.
So we don't have to change the practices, we have to change how we practice the practices in order for them to edify us. We don't have to change the rituals or deny the rituals, we simply have to obey what the rituals ask us to do, what God has asked us to do with the uh, rituals. And then finally, Leviticus reminds us that we become holy through a sacrifice of blood and we maintain that holiness through obedience to God's commands. True, the true requirement behind their commands is the same as they are for us today. I've mentioned that several times, that we love God wholeheartedly and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. In Galatians 5.14, Paul writes, for the whole law, the whole law, you know, that's, that's Leviticus, that's Exodus, that's number, you know, the whole law, he says. And all the regulations that are found in the law that we're going to be studying are fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the ultimate goal of holiness. The ultimate goal of holiness is not that we become holier than thou. You know, you know what that means, right? Holier than thou. That's not the goal of holiness. The goal of holiness is that we love God appropriately and that we love our neighbor as God would have us to love our neighbor. That's the goal of the holy lifestyle. Leviticus helps us to understand how God trained his people to get to this point. All right, let's talk about the outlines. This first lesson here, probably the longest of, of the lessons because there's so much to cover. There are various ways that this book can be outlined. Remember that the overall theme is holiness, both God's intrinsic holiness and man's way to become holy. So you have various ways to outline the book. The first outline is from the Harper Study Bible. <clears throat> it's the shortest of the outlines, two parts. First part, the way of approach to a holy God, Leviticus 1 to 16. Part two, maintaining fellowship with a holy God, Leviticus 17 to 27. That's a kind of easy way to remember this book. Half of it is, you know, how to approach a holy God. The other half of it is how to maintain holiness ourselves. Outline number two is the opposite. It's the expanded outline. It has all the details. Uh, outline number two has four main parts and each part is broken down. So the four main parts are the offerings, you know, the general regulations and the priestly regulations about the offering of animals so on and so forth. Second part, the priesthood, how the priests themselves were prepared for their work and how they were installed into service. The third part, uncleanness, uh, cleanness, uh, cleanliness rather, and uncleanliness. In other words, the regulations that distinguish between clean and unclean, what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. And of course, uh, information about the Day of Atonement, the high day in the uh, calendar, the religious calendar of the Jews. And then the fourth section, the Holiness Code, uh, chapter 17 to 27. And here we have, um, we have eight parts, the sanctity of blood, the moral laws, the priestly regulations, the worship calendar. The Jews had a regular calendar and they had a sacred calendar and we'll study the various festivals that fit uh, in the uh, worship calendar. Uh, oil, bread, and blasphemy, rules about these things, the Sabbath year and Jubilee, fascinating, fascinating um, uh, ordinances for the Jews to follow, uh, various rewards and punishment, and vows and tithes uh, spoken of at the end. Again, the theme of the book of Leviticus is centered on holiness, so the outline that we will use for our study will be one that follows the general theme. And here it is, outline number three, training for holiness. This outline has two parts. First part, attaining holiness, uh, chapters one to 16. Attaining holiness through offerings, through a consecrated priesthood, by distinguishing between clean and unclean and by observing the day of atonement. There you go, attaining holiness. And then the second part, 
practicing holiness, 17 to 27, this here has individual responsibility to keep God's moral and ritual laws. We learned about that. The priestly responsibilities for the priest to function properly as God's representative. The nation's responsibility to promote holiness. We see these in the keeping of the various festivals and I'll explain to you uh, each of the festivals they had to keep and the purpose for them and so on and so forth. Reasons for practicing holiness. You know, the book explains to us why should we make the attempt to follow these commands in order to be holy? You know, why? What's in it for us? Uh, and the answer is very clear. Blessings. Uh, God names all the blessings that come with uh, those who are practicing holiness and the curses that come for those who neglect these practices. And then finally, evidence of holiness and those are the vows and the uh, valuations. Of course, this is just the general framework for the material contained in the book of Leviticus. Uh, you know, the outline is, is a tool to help us know what we're talking about and where we are when we begin adding detail to our study, because it's easy to get lost in the weeds. There's so many details. So every once in a while, we're going to back up. We're going to put our, you know, our outline up on the, on the screen and we're going to pinpoint exactly where we are in our studies so that we can always keep things into a proper context. So we know exactly you know, what it is we're studying and what part of the book uh, that, we are, uh, that we are in. A uh, lot of other information points that we will add to each of the headings contained in this outline. So I'm going to ask you to keep it handy. You know, I'll give it to you. You won't have to copy this down. It'll be in your workbook. And so you can always go back to the outline in order to figure out uh, where you are. Let's see, one more slide. Yes, here's the homework. I encourage you to read Leviticus chapters one to 10. If you plan to follow up, you know, to, to do lesson number two, I would say before you click on, you know, next lesson two, I would read chapters one to 10 because I don't have time to read all of the, you know, all of the verses. Uh, we read some of the verses, I comment on some of those and we will, you know, explain all of the verses, but we won't read all of them. If you read ahead, you'll be familiar with uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm talking about in chapters uh, one to 10. Well, uh, that's our uh, first uh, uh, lesson. Uh, next time, we're going to examine more closely this idea of holiness, uh, collective holiness, and uh, begin uh, preparing for our study of the, uh, of the text. So I uh, thank you for being with us uh, today. I look forward to seeing you next time, remind you uh, about getting that workbook. Uh, it'll make this course much more uh, easy uh, to follow. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.